Today's topic is endodontic diagnosis. This is something I want to encourage each one of you to become better at because my assertion is that our profession is excellent at finding toothaches, meaning patients that have symptoms and complain about it, but we're not so good at finding irreversibly involved, pulpally involved teeth that need endodontics. And oftentimes, we're not so good at finding those if they're quiescent and if the patient's asymptomatic. So in those instances, there's a lot we can learn to better serve our patients. Because everything that you do beyond your initial diagnostic visits and you lay out your treatment plan, everything is based on work you plan to do and the patient agrees to. And oftentimes, we're working on teeth and we have no clue as a profession whatsoever is going on in terms of the status of the pulp. So in endodontic diagnosis, we're always looking to assign the pulp a position on a continuum that varies from absolute total pulpal health to irreversible gangrene necrosis. And of course, there are reversible conditions and there are irreversible conditions and that's what we need to determine when we're doing endodontic diagnosis. So, the three things of endodontic diagnosis are gathering clinical findings, vital pulp testing, and the radiographic exam. But first I want to emphasize the importance of the chief complaint. We need to be great listeners because our patients oftentimes can tell us a great deal about their experience which will tend to lead us to the differential diagnosis that solves their problem. Really, what you're wanting to look for is what? How long has it been hurting? How bad has it been hurting? And what makes it hurt? Let's go back. How long has it been hurting? Has it been hurting the last two days? Has it been hurting the last couple weeks? Or has it been hurting for many months? The second thing is how bad is it hurting? Literally ask patients on a scale of zero to 10. Zero, you don't even know you have a tooth and 10 is as bad as you can imagine with a toothache, where are they? And finally, uh, you want to know what makes it hurt. Does it hurt spontaneously or is it elicited? Elicited would mean it's provoked, the pulp is provoked by a cold stimulus or maybe something hot or maybe biting pressure as examples. So really learn to listen to the patient's chief complaint. In fact, here's, this would be worth your time to do from here forward. Train your receptionist when patients call, first acknowledge and thank them for calling, but after the small chat is done and completed, ask three questions. We're sorry you're hurting, but given that you're hurting, get permission. May I ask you three questions? How long have you been hurting? How bad would you say it hurts on a scale of zero to 10? And finally, what makes it hurt? If you know these three things, you'll even have your receptionists schedule these patients more intelligently because they're all gonna be intrusions into an otherwise busily scheduled day. So emergencies can kill your schedule and they can make you work through lunch and late at night. So to avoid some of that, let's schedule intelligently. And we can do that by asking those three questions. The first part of the endodontic exam would be just the clinical findings. And we all know about that, but it's important to review what it is that we want to look at. And I like to gently grasp the lips and pull them down in the case of the mandible or up in the maxilla and look way up into that vestibule. And you're looking for swellings, sinus tracts, uh, staining. We can break out our mouth mirror and start moving it around just to cursory get a pretty good glance at some of these teeth. And if you see in this lateral incisor, this unusual anatomical cingulum, uh, look really high up in the vault and you'll notice there's a little red, a uh, few millimeter in diameter circumscribed reddish circle and that is a sinus tract that's draining from this lateral incisor. Let's look at the radiograph that corresponds to this clinical view. In this radiograph you can see of the lateral incisor you can notice there's extensive osseous breakdown. The tooth is virgin, but the lateral incisor has that pronounced bulge at the lingual 
on its cingulum and of course in there is a groove and microbes can get into that groove and get into the underlying dentin and leak up through the tubules and get into the pulp proper where it infects this region of the canal. So it's really important on these exams to look really high like we just noticed in the palatal vault of this patient. I like to do percussion with a mouth mirror using little short vertical strokes, gentle but firm, on both the buccal and lingual cuss tips. Oftentimes a cue stick works perfectly and more effectively than the mouth mirror because it can simulate more appropriately what the patient does out of the office when they go into their various working and balancing excursions. Oftentimes, some people will like to use the two sleuth. It's just another way to perform the bite test. It's quite uh, predictable. And then we can use marking paper and have the patient do little short vertical work and balance excursions and maybe even protrusive and mark teeth to make sure they're not in premature occlusion. The finger can be used to palpate the roots of the maxillary teeth. They lie very close to the cortical plate. However, sometimes the finger is too big in the instance of the mandibular incisor, and a cue stick is a better choice. So we need to probe every sulcus, and we need to use a little metric probe. And here you can see blanching of the tissue, which means the probing is gentle but intentional, but not so much that the patient's in trouble. You're looking for narrow defects. Transillumination is an excellent test because we can use a fiber optic wand and we can play light buccal to lingual or lingual to facial and we can watch the light glow and illuminate the entire tooth. We use this test a lot to rule in or rule out a vertical fracture. And if you just keep moving down the arch in a posterior direction, you can notice in this bicuspid tooth that the light is broken about mid root. In other words, the lingual half of the tooth is illuminated, but the buccal half is dark. So the vertical fracture over the mesial marginal ridge, we can say it breaks a beam of light. So as we move on through our diagnostic scheme, mobility is a critical test because badly infected teeth oftentimes lose attachment and they become more mobile. So you're looking at the tooth that is more mobile than the adjacent the opposing or the contralateral teeth. So moving forward, when you start to observe the occlusion of your patients, um, we all know about these things, but oftentimes in endodontics, if there's prematurities or somebody's pounding on an, a restoration that is perhaps high, uh, they're gonna play with it and that can retard healing and keep people sore. So you're really looking at how the teeth relate and how they go through their work balance and protrusive excursions. And you're also looking at the vestibules and the free gingival margins and basically everything that would disclose uh, either some pathology or that the patient is in optimal health. If you look in even tighter, we wanna look at the soft tissues response to extensive restorative procedures. We're looking at that free gingival margin we're looking at the attached gingiva, the lion mucosa, and you know, there's also dark teeth. And teeth can be dark because congenitally, the fetus oftentimes during development, if the mother is taking antibiotics such as tetracycline, you can get staining of the teeth. But also you can get staining of a tooth that needs a root canal. In other words, it's a pulpless tooth, or it could be a stained tooth as a result of endodontics where the access cavity is leaking and or sealers have been left behind and they've stained into the dentinal tubules. So dark teeth are definitely a flag and in this instance you can see that mandibular central incisor is in fact dark and I can tell you from my history of the patient it's secondary to a traumatic accident. So here's a little perilous or pimple on the gum and this is a sinus track and we want to always trace these to make sure we know where it's emanating from. So the etiology in this instance, is it the canine or is it the lateral incisor? Always trace the fistula, like in this case, because when you trace the fistula, when we take a radiograph, we're going to see where the sinus track is uh, occurring. 
And furthermore, in this case, it was previously treated with a silver point. So as the endodontics has leaked and broken down, uh, there's been loss of attachment. And obviously, as the bone has eroded away, the soft tissue is being stained. And it's like an amalgam tattoo. In this case, it would be a silver point tattoo. And some of your patients can be pretty concerned about discoloration if there's some phobia or concern uh, or familiar history with, with cancer as an example. So here's the case where there's quite a bit of swelling over the attached gingiva of this right central incisor that was involved through a traumatic episode. You're looking at bigger, more obvious swellings. And of course, in instances like this, if they're fluctuant and readily movable to gentle palpation, the patient can benefit from an IND procedure. But oftentimes, if it's firmer and more hard and less fluctuant, it's counterproductive to try to do an IND because you just superimpose a lot of trauma over an already pretty sore area. In this instance, obviously with infection, we need to determine which tooth is the culprit and then initiate endodontics if it's appropriate. And in this case, we did do an IND to relieve a lot of purulence out of that distended tissue. So we've looked at the clinical findings and that would pretty much uh, wrap up what I would think all of us are doing. And if we start to do that in a very deliberate, careful and thoughtful way, you're going to be more attuned to endodontic diagnosis. And as you become a better diagnostician, you're going to find that you're intercepting teeth that need endodontics before restorative dentistry rather than after.